Who would have thought 18 months ago, 20, whatever it's been, that we would be sitting here today still in a pandemic, still in partial shutdown, still with kids going to school, at least going to school, but with masks on, some still with social distancing, some kids still taking the option of remote learning and all. When this started, I think everybody thought, well, maybe a few weeks, maybe not. But here we are, and we're approaching the end of another school year, and I am very, very concerned about it, and I am very fortunate, very blessed to have a good friend and colleague in Dr. Michelle Borba. She is here today, and let me tell you a little about her if you don't know. She is an internationally renowned educator. She's an award-winning author. Her current book, by the way, I'll show you right now, is Thrivers. Listen, she is not a theoretician. Thrivers is a great book. It is the surprising reasons why some kids struggle and others shine. And we're going to talk about that some today. But she is recognized for her solution-based strategies to strengthening children's character, their resilience, and reducing peer cruelty. And when I say she's not a theoretician, of course she does research. Of course she has empirical underpinnings to everything she does. But she puts verbs in her sentences instead of just standing up and talking about theory. She offers realistic, research-based advice that every parent can use. I don't care if you got one child, two children, five children. And she takes it from a career working with over a million parents and educators the world over. In fact, we're finding her today all the way in Abu Dhabi. And she was just here in my studio on Monday of this week. So shame on me planning wise. Uh, Dr. Borba, thank you so much for joining me today. <laughs> you are so welcome. Thank you. I am so thankful. It's 1 a.m. where you are right now. Yeah, but I'm on the right time zone. Back to you. So thank you. And this is such a crucial, crucial topic. I'm so glad that you were bringing this up because, boy, our kids are hurting and it's time for us to step up to the plate. I'm so concerned that what we're doing in schools all the way through the universities right now are counter to what we know the psychological science teaches us. I was talking to Dr. Mannion recently, and we talked about this, if somebody has been really violently attacked yeah. or maybe yeah. they've been raped or something like that, and you're going into a class where that's going to be some of the content, letting them know that, and maybe they decide that's not the class for them right now, totally get it, 100%, give them a chance to heal from the inside out. But some of these things that are just political views or economic views that they say, well, that's traumatizing to me. I'm going to need to be in a safe space. I'm sorry. That's counter to psychological science. In psychological science, if there's something that is not a genuine threat and someone is reacting to it, in psychological science, we say, we do exposure therapy. We do systematic desensitization. We do even immersion therapy. We do all different kinds of things to get them to where they can accommodate to that. They can cope with that. But what's happening in the educational system right now is we're protecting them from that instead of teaching them to cope with that. That yeah. seems to be wrong to me. Yeah, this seems to me fires. wrong. Exa oh, we are so in line on that one. I, first of all, I think what we've done is we've misinterpreted trauma. There are some children who clearly have been through trauma. Other kids, I think it's grief. Grief is going to dissipate. But the majority of our kids are going through disappointment. And one of the ways you get through life, uh, I learned this again when I was working on Army bases. Navy SEAL said, you learn to chunk the fear. 
So what do you mean you chunk the fear? I said, well, our goal is to get through the battle. But if we thought about the whole battle, it'd be overwhelming. So instead, what we do is think of it in little chunks, like I'm going to get through the first five minutes, then the next 10 minutes, then the next. That is a fabulous thing to tell a child. I know you're overwhelmed getting to school. So put your foot out the door. The next day, put two feet out the door. Next day, walk down to the mailbox. Chunk the child's fear, but don't sugarcoat it and bubble wrap them so he's having to not do it at all. He'll never be able to get through little teeny safe risks at a time till he finally says, I got it. I did it. Yeah, and that's the psychological science, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical therapy. You deal with the reality that's facing you. And with the world opening back up right now, which pretty much we're seeing, and I hope it continues. You say that parents expect their kids to just snap out of it after two years of pandemic, but you have talked to so many of these kids, and you say they're suffering from really severe separation anxiety. What do parents do to transition them back into their lives? If you're dealing with, first of all, you always figure out as the mom, as the dad, what's the one little thing that's really causing this kid stress? For a lot of kids, it's they've been faced with the loneliness. They haven't seen friends for a while. So now they're in a state of angst of now how do I get back on the scene? The fascinating thing on this one is loneliness is all matter of learning social skills by practicing them, exercising them. And you can do that in your own home. The three most highly correlated traits of well-liked kids. They say hello. They encourage one another. High five. Good job. And they always look at the color of the talker's eyes. They don't look down. That makes you look wimpy. You look up. Now, how do you do that at home? Not like at six o'clock, we're going to learn how to be you know, socially tapped. It's like, okay, we're going to go to the supermarket today. But as we do it, or as we walk through the street, let's start modeling those skills. The first step is just get them back on the track so they feel safer and more secure with one another face-to-face. -face. They've been looking at screens, a lot of them, for two years, and it's a little bit threatening. But don't say you don't have to, sweetie pie. Let's bring over the one play date. Let's start playing. Maybe you're overwhelmed for two hours. So bring the play date over for 15 minutes and gradually keep stretching them. Don't bubble wrap them. Figure out how to help them get back on track, slowly taking them from where they are and keep on supporting them until they get there. Yeah, that's the successive approximations. Maybe they used to take it for granted to be three hours or spend the night with a friend. So maybe now you do 15 minutes and 30 minutes, then you go to the mall with them and take them both to the food court or something and let them spend time with more stimulation. But now you did something that I found really intriguing. You have gone around the country, either in person or Zoom, and sat down with groups of kids. You spent half hour, hour with these kids, and one of the things you asked them was, give me a word that describes you, just one word that describes you right now. What did they tell you? Number one, I don't care where it is and what zip code, overwhelmed. Unbelievable. It's like the top one that keeps coming up. I'm just overwhelmed. Um, another one that keeps coming up is stress, lonely, um, unmotivated. Some kids call it lazy, other kids call it unmotivated, but it's almost pessimistic. I don't know if I can, this world is so different, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. They're so honest that when you ask them, they always come up with the, here's what I am. And then we do the next question, so what's causing it? And the fascinating thing is very often it's the overwhelm because I don't know where to start. I have so much work and I'm never going to be able to catch up. You know, Dr. Phil, another one that keeps coming up is I don't want to disappoint my parents. Really? I'm really worried about uh, they put so much time and energy into it. I know grades are important, but I just don't know if I can keep doing this. We have got to, first of all, recognize our kids are struggling. They're hurting. And some of them are afraid to tell us where they're at. So this is maybe the first step is step in and realize your kid is not where they used to be. Look, if you're talking about a 10-year-old, over the last two years, a 10-year-old has already lost 20% of their life in the last two years if they haven't had the experience. You're not going to have the kid where he was before. You got to take him from where they are now and gently keep helping them get back on track. One thing you may want to do is, you know, connect with the teacher. 
and find out what the child's current abilities are, if it's learning, or if you're seeing the child at home, how's the child behaving in the classroom? You and I know kids behave differently in different situations. <laughs> so yeah. find out where what's going on and what others who care desperately about your kids are seeing, because that's going to help you know, so what am I going to do about it? Well, when they said overwhelmed, and I know you followed up with questions, were they overwhelmed with the academic gap or was it also the social anxiety? Was it all of this rolled in together? Had they lost so much schoolwork wise that they didn't think they could ever catch up? What was it that was overwhelming to them? If it's a junior if a junior in high school or a senior, they're scared to death about what's the next path. Am I going to make it into college? How am I going to go there? But I think what's happening with the overwhelmed point is it's the buildup. It's not one thing. It's this steady buildup. I always tell parents it's like building blocks. When you see your kid playing with the building blocks, think of that each building block as one stressor. And you keep building and building. And then who's pulling one out or who's putting something in its place? After a while, pretty soon, they tumble. And that's what the kids are saying. Where do I start? The homework is so much. That's the first thing. And they'll tell you, and I can't focus like I used to be. So it's their attention span is also shorter than they were. If that stress is building, what goes? We all know it. We're zoomed out. There are our own stress is going up. Watch out. They're also sleep deprived. So they're not sleeping as they used to do because their stress is building. It's all this cumulative concept that's coming up. Well, you said you asked them about stress and they said before COVID, they rated themselves an average of five, during COVID, seven. And now as they're coming out on a one to 10, they were nine to 11. That's the shocker. I was, whoa, because I was writing that on chart paper. Each one of these is a focus group of 10, 15 kids that are representing the pulse of their, their, uh, their school. But when I kept looking at it, why is it rising when it looks like we're starting to move out of COVID? We're now looking at what we call the aftermath, I think. It's the effect that they realize they're almost to the point where maybe we're going to be safe. Maybe we're going to take our masks off. Who knows? But it's this buildup of now I don't know where to start. I've got so much that I've lost. I'm overwhelmed with it. And that's the piece that we need to help them start chunking down. So where do you start? What's the first thing? I think that's the other thing. They look at the homework. They look at the assignment. I said, what skills do you need that would have helped you? And the fascinating thing is many of the high school kids says time management. I just don't know how to manage my time. I've got so much on my plate. Where do I start? You talked about asking kids what was really important to them, and mm -hmm. parents didn't make the top of the list or even close. That was the other shocker, because many of these schools also did very simple little surveys. They asked three, I asked them to ask the kids three simple questions, and the kids could answer anonymously. Question number one is, what do you appreciate about what your teachers are doing? Question number two, what do you appreciate about your parents? Question number three is, what's the one word that describes you most? Teachers came up as the caring champions. I love the, the lunch duty teacher. She always sings. She makes me feel good when I walk to the cafeteria. I love the bus driver. He always says, hey, come on in. It's going to be okay. The teacher who's meeting me at the door. Parents, that was the devastating one. About half of the kids said that what they appreciated most of their family, hang on to your hat on this one, was their dog. The dog. Yeah. The second one was an older sibling who was helping them. When I said, what are the things your parents are doing? It was making me food or taking me to school. It was a few kids who appreciated sitting down and talking to me. But the kids also said, I think it's the parents don't know what to tell us. I said, so what would you suggest a parent do to make you feel better? Well, sometimes when they don't know what to say, just sit there calmly next to me, just so I know that you're there. It's okay. You don't have to say anything, but maybe just rub my back or say it's going to be okay or laugh like you used to. Then we're not laughing as a family anymore, and it's really making me feel bad. These are juniors in high school. Yeah, and a lot of that is because these parents are experiencing a lot of stress right now too, right? Oh, absolutely. Listen, in uh, absolutely, we are so stressed. They're worried about finances. They're worried about health. Maybe they've gone through uh, my business, now the gas prices, now a war. It's just the build up, build up, build up. But it's also a time when we got to realize as the parent, the single most important thing 
that really helps our kids other than we love them when we like them and we've got the firm guidelines. But when all the research on child development comes in and what's a really effective parent, number two on the list is we manage stress so it doesn't spill over to our kids. So we can teach all these kids coping skills. I think every once in a while we need to take the deep breath ourselves and be the mirror so that our children are seeing somebody relaxed so that they can be relaxed. The impact of this school closure that we've had, this remote learning that we defaulted to, is going to be impacting for years to come if we don't do something to close the gap. How do we do that? Number one is resilience is the answer to it. But I think a big mistake that parents think is there's only a set window. It's too late. Or it started when he was three. It's not too late for any of us or the entire counseling industry would go out of business. So first, we add it to the plate. And second of all, we start chunking this whole thing called resilience. When I was writing Thrivers, my goal was to look at seven traits that are highly correlated to success. Not every kid needs all seven of those. Can you tell us the seven? Oh, sure. It starts with confidence. Confidence is knowing your strengths. And let's help our kid focus more on their strengths as opposed to their weaknesses. 77% of the time, we try to fix the kid as opposed to help them learn where you're going with your strengths. You know, the simplest thing that Emmy Warner discovered, many of the children who really had extreme adversity in their life had a hobby. And the hobby, I didn't make a difference. It was uh, guitar or books or hiking. They would go to that to decompress. Dr. Phil, when I was interviewing kids and said, what's your hobby? Many of them looked at me absolutely dumbfounded. Who's got time for a hobby? So that's number one. We've got to start with that. Maybe we start being talent scouts. We walk around the house and we look at tuning into what our kids are good at as opposed to what their weakness are and start pointing that way. Another one would be empathy. We need social competence. We know that many children who are resilient have ability to connect with others. Now we've got loneliness factors and and social competence and empathy is made up of social skills. So if that's the part that's low, then let's start focusing in on how to help our kids get along. The third one is every kid in the world needs self-control coping strategies, how to get rid of that stress so it doesn't become so darn unhealthy. There's at least 30 strategies in the self-control strategies, that chapter on how to help them. So you find one. You know, here's another thing that kids said, Dr. Phil. They said, I know you're teaching us self-control strategies, but it's not like a one-time course in a health unit. You got to give us a repertoire of stuff that we can actually do in the here and now. Then we got to practice it. Like on the show, I was teaching Kira the one-two breathing, which is so simple. As soon as the stress comes in, when you start identifying what your stress signs are, you take the slow, deep breath from real deep in your abdomen, like you're riding up an elevator. Keep focusing on on the breath, hold it, then slowly let it out. The exhale is twice as long as the inhale. Kids said that really works, but unless you help us practice and practice and practice and practice when we're calm, it doesn't kick in. What Dr. Bohr was talking about here, a one to two ratio of inhale and exhale, is not as simple as it sounds. It has to do all the way to the cellular level of the exchange of oxygen and calming yourself down. So you can hear something like that and go, oh, yeah, you had some lady on there talking about breathe slow. No, no, she's talking about regulating yourself. It's almost meditative. It causes you to really slow down and exercise control in the face of stress, which, again, as I said earlier, you observe yourself doing And that's just one of several things that she talks about in this chapter on self-control. I said she wasn't a theoretician, that she puts verbs in her sentences. This chapter on self-control puts your child back in command of their ship. And I can't tell you how important role-playing is. If you take these things in her self-control chapter and you actually role-play this with your children, so they practice it and do it, this can be an absolute game changer. Oh, I thank you because you also nailed something else on that one that I think we're doing wrong as parents. We tell our kids these things instead of showing them. Any skill is better if you show it, not tell it, 
then you do it over and over again. With little kids, go teach the teddy bear. For bigger kids, go teach someone else. For bigger kids, bigger when teens, they roll their eyes at you and I'm going, come on. The most elite forces in the world called Navy SEALs. This is what they do. You can do this. All you need to do is keep practicing and practicing. The exhale has got to be twice as long as the inhale. Yeah, And these Navy SEALs, they don't do it till they get it right. They do it till they can't get it wrong because their life depends on it. There you go. That's it. I think the other thing with parents when they're stressed is, oh my gosh, how am I going to feed that in? I got so much other things to do. Just if you take one thing like one, two breathing and you weave that in one or two minutes a day and you do it for a month, that alone is going to help your child learn a skill they're going to use the rest of their life. There's dozens of ideas in there. Don't do them all or your kid will never let you read another book. Find what works for your family and you keep working and working and working on it because your new goal as a mom or a dad is to help your learn your child learn to cope without you. That's how they're going to get through a very uncertain world. They're going to need a new skill set. Your next one is integrity. Talk about that a little bit. Well, fascinating enough is that integrity is that piece that's that strong moral code and compass. And people go, what that have to do with resilience? There's a whole bunch of different kinds of challenges. Some kinds of challenges are the stress challenges, but integrity would be the challenge like the peer pressure challenge. Is that right? Is that wrong? When we look at kids who get over that hump, They have you as the parent planting very strongly in them what our beliefs are in this family. And that means it's a lot and a lot of conversations. Dr. Phil, the easiest thing I've ever seen, there was an incredible girl named Mia Dunn. Every high school teacher said, would you go figure out how that kid came to be such a kid with amazing integrity? So I pulled her aside. She was a senior in a Florida upscale school. And I said, okay, Mia. Every single high school teacher is asking me to find out how you got the integrity. How'd you do it? She laughed and she said, oh, it was how I was raised. I said, okay, how were you raised? She said, oh, I remember when I was six, my parents called us, my two brothers and me into the family room. There was all this chart paper and marking pen. My dad said, sit down. We're going to figure out what kind of family we want to be remembered for. So we're going to brainstorm kinds of words. Mom's going to write them all down. I don't care what the words are, respectful, responsible, honest, whatever. We're going to write them all down, and then we're going to vote. At the end of, I don't know how many little bits of time, mom ran out of room on the mark, on the all of the chart paper, and dad said, let's vote. And we all voted for honest. I said, okay, easy. So how'd you remember it? She laughed, and she said, it was impossible not to. My mother must have said it 50 times a day. Remember, we're the honest duns. She dropped us off at school. Hey, remember the honest duns. We'd be reading a book. Those guys were honest duns. They said it so much, we became it. Oh, I love that quote, because that's how you instill integrity. You got to be the value system for your kids. Stand up and start embedding it in your child so they become what you want them to be. Yeah, it's so important that you have rituals and traditions in your family, and they take pride in that, where you just say, we just don't do that. We do this. And that's so important for their identity. So important. Okay, next. Curiosity. Yes, I curiosity. Love curiosity. That's that kid who thinks out of the box with ideas and people. The easiest one on that one, when you go, what the heck does that have to do with resilience? It's not to raise a kid who's an Albert Einstein creative child, but it's a child who realizes that when they're confronted with a problem, there's no problem so great that can't be solved. And that's what you're looking for, for agency. The easiest way to do that from this moment on is when your child comes home or he's sitting there with a problem, don't solve it for him. Instead, what's bugging you, sweetie pie? Say it. Then you teach him the simplest thing that there is called brainstorming 101. Keep a poker face because some of the ideas they come up with are going to be off the chart. But what's one thing you could have done? What's another thing for a kid who goes, how long do I have to do it for one minute till the sand runs out? But if you keep brainstorming and then you're all done and you go, okay, now get rid of things that aren't safe, wise, or responsible. What's the one thing you're going to choose? Good. Now let's create the plan. What you're doing is creating agency. So when the child is faced with a real life problem, he's got it. And that's, again, what that thriver has. It's okay, mom. I can do it myself. Oh, there's your moment to get get a spa day, mom. I got it. Yeah, that's so important. Again, that's them observing themselves, figuring something out. And even if they're off the charts with some of them, that's so important. 
what we were talking about before of how we're preparing these kids in school, but it's perseverance. Yes, it's perseverance. Here's the problem, Dr. Phil, is that every parent wants the kid to persevere right this minute. And what I discovered is that of these seven traits, you got to have that self-control in order to have the buffer or self-confidence is really wonderful in order to help that kid persevere. In fact, the other thing I learned that was my aha moment is that isn't one trait or two traits, but you put any two together, they multiply the outcome. So it's like superpowers for a child. Self-control and perseverance, wonderful. Carol Dweck has got the greatest solution on perseverance. Stop praising them for the end product. What you get? Did you get the 100%? What's the grade? Instead, you make success in your house become a four-letter word, G-A-I-N. Yesterday you were here, sweetie. You got 33 right. Tomorrow you're going for 34. It's one step, one step, baby step. Success is always in steps. You never win the gold medal tomorrow. You win it in little teeny increments along the way. And, and that's the goal on perseverance. So wonderful on the science that tells us how to help our kids hang in there and not quit. The last one you mentioned is optimism, which is so important. You're watching a group of kids who have been every day for the last two years turning on a TV set and seeing how many people died today. Now you've got a live feeds of a horrific war. You've got images that are really impacting our kids. And many of them say, I just feel hopeless. I'm really worried about the world. I think this one is one of the easiest things from NYU that said, images that our kids see either elevate their empathy and their optimism, or they create doom and gloom. Okay, one of the easiest things you can do on that one, I think we don't do nearly enough. Look what the research says and apply it. Go to the back page of the newspaper every day. There's incredible, glorious stories about real kids doing wonderful stuff. Cut out the news, blow it up. Now you got another family meeting or an entertaining just dinner discussion. Did you hear about true story? Here, I love this one. The two kids in Ohio, they were so worried about the neighbor next door, Empathy 101, because she's 80. She's all by herself, mom. She's so lonely. Can't we do something? What can you do, sweetie? I love mommy. What can you do, kids? Can we drag our cellos to her porch and do a cello concert? Good idea, said mom. They drag their cellos, go to the porch, knock on the door. They social distance. They do a little cello concert. All the neighbors come out. They're crying. Mom's crying. She puts it on Facebook. It goes live. What happens is the virtual of all the rest of the children in the world look at it and go, I can do that too. You're elevating their heart. You're seeing tuba concerts in Sacramento, flute concerts in New York. We've got to show our kids the good stuff that's doable. Now they put it in their hearts. They've got the agency. That's what builds hope.